Greetings, my friends. Shalom, chavrim. In the book of Isaiah, Yeshayahu, in chapter 51, I want to read to you just a, a short verse here in verse 22 and 23. And God says here through the prophet, Thus says the Lord, the Lord and your God, who pleads the cause of his people, See, I have taken out of the hand, take, excuse me, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling. He's speaking to Israel. The dregs of the cup of my fury, you shall no longer drink it. But I will put it into the hand of those who afflict you, who have said to you, Lie down that we may walk all over you. And you have laid your body like the ground, and as a street for those who walk over. There's a lot of people that believe that Israel being a nation today is not fulfillment of Scripture. And, of course, that is something that's easy to refute. Uh, but yet, at the same token, this video is not... I'm not putting this video here together for that purpose. But I do want to bring up some important scriptures here before we get into the purpose of this video. And this video, by the way, is, going, is, is, is specifically for the Jewish people. We are going to discuss redemption, the redemption of Israel, and things that we have overlooked as a Jewish people I'm going to discuss with you. Before I do, though, let's look at another scripture here in Isaiah, chapter 54, verse 7. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy Excuse me, on you, says the Lord, Hashem, that is your Redeemer. For this is the like the waters of Noah to me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I, have I sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you, for the mountain shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says Hashem, the Lord, who has mercy on you. Um, there are many, many, many different places in the scripture that we could read here and uh, uh, that speaks of Israel and what God will do for her. Um, another one here that I think that, that, that I would just like to mention, and this is for those that are against the fact that uh, Israel is there as a nation now. In Jeremiah chapter 30, let's look at verse 3. For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I, that I will bring back the captivity, my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Now these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. Now mind you, when Jeremiah makes this prophecy here, the house of Israel is already gone. The house of Judah in the near future would be gone. So he promises the promises to both Israel and Judah. For thus says the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, O fear, not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins, like a woman in labor, and all faces turn pale? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass at that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck. That's interesting in itself right there. And by the way, we can find that type when Elijah goes to find Elisha, when God says to him that he would take his place, that Elisha, uh, I think it's translated in English, that he would be a prophet in his room. It actually says in Hebrew, though, that he would replace him that he would actually replace Elisha. And Elijah, or excuse me, Elisha, when, when Elijah finds Elisha, he's plowing behind 12 yoke of oxen. Speaking of the coming of one of the two witnesses to Israel, the spirit of Elijah, now it's not reincarnation, but the spirit of Elijah coming upon uh, the, 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 uh, a man for this day here and would find Israel still under the uh, yoke of bondage. But when Elijah passes by and puts his mantle upon him. 
sh showing a, a type of what would happen in the future, he does so when Israel is still under bondage. And of course, Elisha goes and breaks the yoke off of the oxen's neck. And Israel is free. So, just an interesting little thought there to throw your way. And I will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I shall raise up for them. Interesting in itself there. Um, we find also verse 18 uh, behold, I will bring back the captivity of Jacob's tents and have mercy on his dwelling places. The city shall be built upon its own mound. Uh, so many scriptures we could look at here. Chapter 31, verse 10. Uh, hear the word of the Lord. This is in Jeremiah's deal. O nations, and declare it unto the isles afar of off, and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of the ones stronger than he. I mean, we can we can just go on and on and on and on and on and on. Uh, another beautiful one here uh, in chapter 33. Uh, in verse, look at verse um, 8 here. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned and by which they have transgressed against me. Then it shall be then, then it shall be to me a uh, name of uh, be to me a name of joy, a praise, and honor before the nations of the earth. Who shall hear all the good that I do to them? They shall fear and tremble for the goodness and all the prosperity that I provide for it. Thus says the Lord: Again, there shall be heard in this place of which you say. It is desolate. Interesting. Without man, without beast, and the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man and without inhabitant and without beast, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of those who will say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endures forever. And those who will bring the sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord, for I will cause the captivity of the land to return as at the first, says the Lord. Now, some, especially in Christianity, might think in this case here, well, this is Jesus and uh, the bride of Christ there. Hashem is married to Israel. Remember that. He returns Israel to their homeland. And God is still their God. Isaiah 61 kind of corresponds with that here. You know, it's funny how that a lot of times in, 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 the, in the Christian Bibles, we do it in the Jewish Bibles as well. Uh, they do the corresponding chapters. I, I kind of do my own a lot of times because uh, I see things there that God uh, that should be linked together with this here. But Isaiah 61 um, interestingly, uh, for the Christian people, this is also where uh, Jesus picked up the scroll when he was here on earth and he read from the beginning. He put the scripture down in the middle of verse 2 there and he said, uh, this day of this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Um, but uh, he didn't go to the other half of the second verse there. Uh, kind of interesting. But anyway, let me just bring this to your mind, though. And, 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 and kind of like beginning where he left off is interesting to say. And the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified, and they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Now, keep in mind, my brothers, you can go from one sentence to the other, and it can be a space of 20, 30 years go by. It could be a space of 2,000 years for that matter. So just keep that in mind. But they build the former desolations. And we get on down and we find out that it uh, says, um, oh gosh, where is it here? Um, oh goodness here. 
But you shall, verse 6, but you shall be named the priest of the Lord. They shall uh, call you the servants of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles and in the, the, their glory. You shall boast instead of your shame. You shall have double honor. And instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in the land, they shall possess the double everlasting joy shall be theirs. So the Lord loves justice and he hates robbery uh, and so on and so forth here. Now, a lot of people get confused that when God makes these promises here, we're expecting just to be all peace hunky-dory over in Israel. It's not the case. If that were the case, why then does God say that all, the, all, all those that trouble themselves with Israel, he'll make it a trembling cup for them. A lot of things are going to be taking place, my friends, a lot of things. But anyway, as I said, though, this video is not where I intended to get into proving that we are a nation, but I intend to get into redemption for my own people here. So let's take a look at redemption here. And part of the redemption process for us as Jews is though to return to our homeland. It is the promise that God made us. And I find interesting that in the Christian Bible, and uh, Nehemiah Gordon pointed this out in an interview he did uh, when he was talking about his uh, book that he had that came out. He said, he brought out how that when Jesus prayed the what's called the Lord's Prayer, that he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And Nehemiah points out that hallowed means to sanctify thy name. And of course, the Father in Christianity is the God of Israel, Yahweh, Hashem. And, um, but Nehemiah got into a little bit about the purpose that uh, Jesus, when uh, Jesus or Yeshua makes this prayer here uh, to sanctify the name of God. And what I find fascinating myself is that we can find the answer to that question in Ezekiel chapter 36. And this is part of our redemption. And that is, one, God has to get us to our homeland. God doesn't, re God, you know, when I say redemption process, redemption process began before we were scattered. But it's going to be completed in the latter days. As Daniel notices in chapter 9, verses 24, 25, and 26, when our iniquities would no longer be remembered, we would be pardoned, our transgressions would all be blotted out. But notice here, let's take a look. Now, God deals with the house of Israel here in Ezekiel chapter 36. And I'm going to skip right on into this, get into the heart of this. Let's go to verse 19. So I scattered them among the nations. They were dispersed throughout the countries, and I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, who? The nations said of them, who? The house of Israel when they were scattered back in 723 B.C., and not just when they first got scattered, but the entire time, ever since, all down through the years, for nearly over 2,000 years, 2,700 years of disbursement. Wow. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore, excuse me, let me back up. I jumped ahead of myself too far. They profaned my holy name when they said of them, these are the people of Hashem, Yahweh, and yet they have gone out of his land. How did we profane the name of Hashem? Because we're no longer in the homeland. Because we're not in Israel. That's what makes the name of God unholy. Not that God's name is unholy in itself, but because why? It looks as if God is not keeping his own word. No wonder Jesus says, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, sanctify your name. He knew that the house of Judah was going to be scattered. I, you know, people, you know, Rabbi Mizrah, he thinks that he never prophesied nothing. He not only prophesied that we'd be scattered, but he also prophesied that our return. And even in his prayer, he tells his own disciples to pray for our return. Because when he makes the comment, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, he is telling us, that, or excuse me, telling the Christian people, pray that God's name will be sanctified. And we find right here, 
that, and according to uh, Ezekiel 36, the way his name is to be sanctified is when we return to the homeland. I'll prove it. Let me read it to you. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, and the nations shall know that I am Hashem, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. Then he tells you how. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries and bring you into your own land. That's how God gets his name hallowed. That's a fulfillment of the prayer, or the part of it anyway, that Jesus prayed. Now it's fixing to get good. Now let's take a look at some things that have troubled the rabbis that I think might help us as a people. You know, what is it? Joel 238, I believe, uh, is cited a lot by the Christians and everything. Uh, let, let me, let me, let's, let's take a look, real quick look at Joel 238, if I can, if I can find out. <laughs> by the way, I'm actually reading to you from a Christian Bible. So, uh, Ravi, don't hold that against me. I know my own rabbi listens to these videos. He, he doesn't ever, he's never said that, but I know he does. I know he does. So, yeah, here we go. Uh, Joel 2.28. Uh, by the way, though, I do have the Torah with me too, my rabbi. I do, I do have it with me. So, <laughs> I'm going to read from the Torah in just a moment here. And it shall come to pass, uh, Joel 2.38, that I will pour all my, my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in heavens and the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke, and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood uh, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of Hashem shall be saved. For out of Mount Zion in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as Hashem has said, among the remnant whom the Lord or whom Hashem calls. So he's going to pour out his spirit in the latter days. Uh, I think there's another place, I forget where that's at, where it says they shall speak with new tongues. Is that right? Something like that. I, I forget where that's at. But anyway, let's go right into uh, the word here, though. I, I, or uh, say the word. Let me get right into the, some Torah Greetings here. I want to show with you something. God is going to pour out His Spirit. A type of God pouring out His Spirit happened to be in the wilderness journey when God commands Moses to gather the elders of Israel with Him after they first started the journey over in uh, Shemot uh, 17. Uh, here. Hashem said to Moses, Pass before the people and take uh, you some of the elders of Israel and in your hand take your staff with you, uh, excuse me, with which you struck the river, and go behold, I shall stand before you, and by the rock in Horeb, you shall strike the rock, and water will come forth uh, from it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the, in the sight of the, uh, the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah Yoim Rabbah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because of their test of Hashem, saying, Is Hashem among us or not? My gosh. It was a test. Israel wanted to see if God was among them or not. And so they smote the rock. Or, or let me put it this way. So God, so, so God had Moses smite the rock. Now, point I want to bring out. In Hebrew, we say Hatsua, the rock. And what's interesting is it's used very few times in the Torah, but every time it's used, it's used in Genesis, it's used in Exodus here, it's in different places. And this particular place here is near the mountain of Horeb and uh, the Caldwells, by the way, Jim and Penny Caldwell, uh, 
discovered this rock uh, near uh, Jebel al Az in northwest Saudi Arabia. Fascinating point. We'll show you a little bit of information on that in a uh, in a DVD that we're going to make basically based on the same video here. Not this video, but sim similar to this here. But anyway, here when we when we look here in the in the Hebrew language here. Um, let me just find that for you over here. Here we go, right here. And he says here, Hine Omed Lifnecha Sham, Al Chatsur Bechorev, Al Chatsur, upon the rock. And so the rock is a specific rock. Now, interestingly enough, when Moses smote this rock, this rock brought forth water. 38 years later, God commands him to speak to the rock, but instead he smites the rock again in anger because the children of Israel are provoking him. And when the rock is split, the water comes out. That rock is the one that the Caldwells discovered, and that rock is a 60-foot rock. When it was split down out of the base of this rock, where there's no, no hole or nothing, but it's, it's just completely washed the stone smooth from the, the tremendous amount of water all down through there. It's like a river was there at one time, but no longer is. Now, I have another different kind of idea about this altogether because I wonder then about what we find in Genesis where it says the river that was Be'idon in Eden and it comes out, the Nahor, Nahor's river comes uh, out, Yotze Eden, and waters the garden that was in Eden, Eden. Now, that seems confusing in itself. Now, how can a river come out of Eden and water the garden that's in Eden? Unless maybe it's another dimension that the water is coming from. I, which makes me, in this case here, I look at the, the rock here that's in the wilderness journey that Moses smites, and I can't help but say to myself, I wonder why their shoes didn't wear out for 40 years. Could these guys have actually, could, could Moses have brought them to the place where in another dimension from where they're at is the Garden of Eden and the water that came, that river that came from Eden that watered the garden that was in Eden, was it now coming from the rock and watering, giving water for the children of Israel, for the camels, for, the, or for, 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 their, for the cattle, the camels, for them, for the washing of their clothes, the cleaning of everything? I mean, this is fascinating to know to know in, if you ask me, and totally different subject. But anyway, that water that come from the rock also represents the waters of life. But it was in a natural. I think it was more than just natural, though, if you want to get right down to it. I really think it was more than natural. But then we have to ask the question, Joel 2.38, who poured out his spirit. So the rock, Isaiah says the rock is God. Not David say the same thing. But let's go back. Let, let's take a look though real quick. Let's go to Bereshit. In Genesis, Bereshit, uh, we find, because we want to look at redemption here. And, and my brother and sister, we don't have time to be playing church. We don't have time to be looking at all kind of different ideas that are going on. And I know there's so much confusion because and those of you that maybe have seen other YouTube videos that I do, I condemn with a passion the covenant that that uh, that Shimon Perez is trying to do with the Vatican. And 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 I mean, go back and look look at Ezra when Ezra was going to build the second temple, and he was getting everything together, getting the people together to reconstruct the second temple. The first thing that he finds out is that the that the leaders and the uh, rabbinical leaders as well, and these and the secular leaders had married in to the Gentile women of that day. And when Ezra heard this, he just he tears his clothes and he repents before the Lord until the evening time. Interesting, he repents to the evening time, showing the evening time hour that we're living in now. And he does it because they married into the monks of Gentiles. It's the same thing when Ahab married Jezebel, he brought idolatry into Israel. And this is what Shimon Perez is doing. He's courting the Vatican. Basically already married. I mean, look at, back in 1993, he'd give up 60% of, uh, of, of the old city to the Vatican. Gosh. 
brought idolatry into Israel. Not to say that we haven't had idolatry all along ever since we've become a nation and everything. The, the Vatican has had their, their, their weasel edges in there. But, but, but my brother, sister, my Jewish brothers and sisters, listen to me. The, the, the Christian Bible speaks of 144,000 that are the Jewish people. It's from the 12 tribes of Israel. And those are virgins, not men. It shows that they're separated from all this different denominational systems of Christianity. God called us to serve Him and Him alone. He commanded Israel in Exodus 23, Shemot. Don't make any covenants. When you come into the land, Joshua told them, you know, or Moses told them, don't make any covenants with the Amorites and the Hittites and the Prizites and, and all the rest of them. Why then are we allowing the Vatican to bring in this false peace? It's a false peace to begin with, to make a peace with the Palestinians, to bring in a, a, a two-state solution. It's no solution. But God will use it to his own glory because God will bring all the nations down to Jerusalem or to, to the Valley of uh, Jehoshaphat and he will, bring, uh, he will bring in that judgment. Those that trouble themselves with our people, they will find out that God is not playing games. But anyway, this is the time of our redemption. This is the time for us to recognize what's going on. Let's take a look here. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, Bereshit, uh, Berek Bet. He says here, these are the, uh, the products of the heaven and the earth when they were created in the day that, that Hashem God made the heaven and the earth. Now all the trees of the field were not yet on the earth, and the herb of the field had not yet sprouted. For Hashem God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to work the soil. A mist, ascend, a mist, mist excuse me, ascended from the earth and watered the whole surface of the soil. And Hashem God formed the man of the dust of the ground, and he blew into his nostrils the soul of life, and the man became a living being. Now, let me take a look at that with you in the Hebrew language here, and I want to point out to you some, some interesting points. Uh, it'd be interesting to Christian people that were to watch this video as well, uh, as well as to my Jewish brethren here. Um, backing up here, let's take a look here. And Hashem, okay. V'yestad Adonai Elohim El HaAdam Afal min ha he takes God from the dirt, from uh, from the earth. Afal it means dirt. They um, pach. But uh, let me let me. Okay, okay. No, no, I'm sorry. Be payav nishmat chayim. Now, this is the point I want to bring to you right here. When he says, Nishmar Chaim, he breathes in his nostrils the breath of life, but Nishmat, this is something that God is doing. He's, he's literally breathing in, but he breathes in Chaim. That is literally... God's life, that is Yahweh's life in a plural form that he breathes into his nostrils. And he breathes it in, and, and the man, it literally says here, and for the soul of the man was the life of Yahweh. Chayah. Literally, this is where the words come from here. So for the soul of the man was the life of Yahweh, he breathed into him the breath of life. Now, even for a Christian person that might come across this video as well, you will get something here if you notice it. When you think of in the garden, there were two trees in the midst of the garden that Adam and Eve were commanded not to eat it, not, you know, or, or excuse me, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were commanded not to eat, touch, or nothing. Don't even mess with it. But there was another tree called the tree of life, Eitz Chaim. Chaim, Eitz Chaim, the tree of life. Now, literally, that is a tree of Yahweh's life. Eitz Chaim. Okay? Now, when I say that, then he breathes Nishma Chaim. He breathes the life. We call it life, but it's literally Yahweh's life in a plural form into Adam. So therefore, 
that tells us right there that the Es Chaim is God himself. Has to be God himself. Why? Because he's breathing in Es Chaim. He's breathing, the, the fruit of Es, the, the, of es Chaim is the Chaim. It's life. It's God's own life. And he takes and he's breathing in Chaim. He's breathing the fruit into the being of Adam. And why is he breathing in more than, why is he breathing it in into a plural form? Because when God created Adam, he created uh, uh, them, both male and female created he, them. Eve was inside of Adam at that time. That's why God had to breathe it in as a plural. He's actually breathing in that fruit. Now, oh, rabbinical brethren rabbinical uh, uh, rabbis Jewish brothers sisters that, that, that may watch this video you may not this may be a little hard but, I, but I, I'm asking you bear with me I want to share with you some things that will help you to understand some things that we're missing in our Torah so I'm going to take you into the Christian Bible. I want to show you something here. I start to sweat a little bit and scratch. I, uh, forgive me. But there's a place called John 1 and 1. Now, brothers, understand me now. I, I know that when we begin to look at anything, we get uh, there's a little nervousness when it comes to Christianity because automatically we say, you know, you're not going to give a Jew three gods. And you're right. I'm right with you right there, brother. I'm right with you right there. I do not believe in three gods. Okay? So you don't have to worry about that, my brother, with me. Not a single bit. Uh, and, and, and I will tell you, there, I know that Christianity, there's a, what they call the Trinity Doctrine. But there's different explanations for that doctrine. Okay? And, and I'm not the one that believes that, well, there's... One God is the Father, and one God is the Son, and one God is the Holy Ghost. No, sir, I do believe. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Okay? That is the whole matter of it. Zekol Devar. Okay? Zekol Devar. Now, in uh, John, I'm going to take you to John, and, and you're going to find out too. You ever take the time to look at this Bible uh, here, the Christian Bible, fascinating. I, the more that I look at this, the more I see that these early apostles, they had a very good understanding. Very good understanding. So right here, right here in John uh, chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, it's kind of fascinating, you know, the Jehovah's Witness people, uh, kind of blasphemous that they even take the name there. But uh, uh, in fact, if you a little thought there on the side there for uh, Christian people that might be watching the video as well. You know, there's a scripture that says that, uh, what is that? I think that's in the Christian Bible there. It said that they, uh, for those that say they are Jews, but are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. That's your replacement theologist. And... Jehovah's Witnesses are probably one of the biggest key figures in that doctrinal belief that there is, uh, next to even the Vatican. Of course, the Vatican's trying to backstep right now and say that they're not replacement theologists, but all you got to do is go look at their websites and their information and, of course, their hatred to the Jews for all these years and everything. They're definitely replacement theologists. Uh, but anyway, though, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word uh, was God. Now, when... I saw this, it began to make more sense what was the first God word that came out of God's mouth. Because this apostle of Jesus right here, John, the apostle of Yeshua, Yochanan, he makes a comment that in the beginning was the word. So when he said that, and then he said, and the word was with God, and the word was God, I couldn't help but wonder. He's referring back to Bereshit. So I go back to Bereshit, and, I, and I, I'm like, okay, then what's the, what's the first word that God says? And, and keep in mind, this will actually link up for you. It's going to link up. Um, uh, it'll, it'll begin to start to make more sense to you, I should say, maybe. Um, 
what redemption is for Israel. It says, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemayim ve et ha'aretz ve ha'aretz ayata tohu ve vohu ve choshek al panecha tohum ve ruach Elohim merchafit al panecha mayim ve yomer Elohim yahi od. There, there, your first word that comes out of the mouth of God is Yahi Or. Now, in English and even in the, uh, the, the Jewish Bible, we translate that, let there be light. But it's actually, when you say Yahi, Yahi is more of an eternal expression. It's not a future tense, it's Yahi Or. It is eternity coming into existence. It is an expression of God making himself material in the dimension in which we live in. So that what? So that he can have fellowship with us. This is what it is. God wanting and longing to have fellowship with us makes himself tangible in a dimension that we live in. Because remember, God is a spirit and he cannot be seen. And it's fascinating. John recognizes here, in the beginning was the word. Well, the first word was the Yahi Od. Or, yeah, excuse me, Yahi Od. There is light. The Yahi Od. And there was light. It still doesn't even say there was. It's not putting anything in the past tense. It's putting everything in the now. Everything in eternity. Everything eternity coming into existence in the realm in which we live in. But it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Mm. That's, a, that's a deep one in itself. But, now, a lot of you are going to think, well, no, that, that, that light is the sun. No, wait a minute. It's not the sun. Now, I'm sorry, I didn't even translate. If you're reading a Christian Bible, we're in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 there. Uh, in the beginning of God, uh, excuse me, and God created the heavens and the earth, and, and, and let me just translate. Bereshit bara Elohim. At the first, God created et hashemayim et ha'as, the heavens and the earth, and he says, the earth hayata tohu bevochu bechoshek apane tohum. And the darkness, the earth was without form, without void, and, and the darkness uh, was upon the face of, uh, 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 of the depth to whom uh, the, the uh, Ruach and the Spirit of God Elohim Ruach Elohim Merachafit uh, and the Spirit of God broods over uh, the, the waters uh, interesting thought if we won't get into that I, I'll keep you here all night Beyomer Elohim Yahyor okay and then, then we find that God says let there be light now here's what's interesting then God says here, after he says, let there be light, we'll just translate it like that for you for now. And God sees that the light is good. And God puts a firmament or a separation between the light and the darkness. Now the Hoshek, interestingly enough, we look at Nachash, there's some similar, you know, Nachash the serpent is very similarly likened with darkness in the first place. So God separates light from darkness. He separates evil from the good, so to speak. But then we go into the luminaries. We go into the, the, the stars and the sun and the moon and things like that, which is only a type, a type of what the or, the or is uh, in Hebrew, the, the light that is. Now, I bring this out to you because we go into a little bit further when we find out that the Etz Chaim, as we were talking about earlier, the tree of life, see, the tree of life is God. It's God is that tree of life. And he, how do we know it's God is a tree? Actually, in this case here, God, oh wow. <laughs> I'm getting excited and getting ahead of myself and trying to explain this here. But God help us and help my Jewish brethren to, to see these things, dear God, and, my, and, and the sisters as well. God basically made, him, made a way for him to be able to fellowship with us in the dimension he created us in. Now, whether or not we were, we had to have been more of a multidimensional being. In other words, when I say multidimensional, I mean in the, in the respect of uh, we look, for example, at Elijah, Eliyahu, Eliyahu, he could actually, 
when we read the story of Eliyahu, we find out in the book of Kings that when Obadiah comes out to, to meet with him and he says, go get Ahab, he's, he's afraid to go get Ahab. He said, because the king has looked for you everywhere. No one can find you. And as soon as you walk off, you'll be gone. God will hide you. God will take you away. Now, this is not being taken away in a chariot of fire. This was on earth. God was constantly moving him around and he couldn't be found. We find the same case with Elisha. When Elisha wanted to be hid, he could be hid by God and no one could find him. You know, God used the prophets, the Navim, in, in a way, in, in a trans-dimensional way. Maybe that's the wrong kind of terminology to use, but he would, they, they, they lived in a realm outside the normal. It was a realm of supernatural. And Adam and Eve lived in the same type of realm, but greater than that. Because why? When God breathed into their nostrils, well, in this case, there's one set of nostrils, but he breathes the breath of life, the Chaim, it was from the Eitz Chaim. It was literally the fruit from the tree of, of Eitz Chaim. He put into them, which was God's own life. Now, I bring, I bring this up for a point to you, my brother and sister. The rabbis know. It's written in the commentaries. I mean, I've got, I've got the Torah right here. Oh, we got the right page, got the Torah, okay. In the, in the very Torah commentaries here, when the rabbis begin to talk about Ish and Isha, which is man and woman, when God is creating them, they make the comment that there's never an explanation why Adam is called Ish in the beginning. Now, we translate that in English as man. But literally, the word Ish, and of course, the, the scholar, the, the rabbi sages and stuff, they do recognize that it comes from the, the, uh, from the divine. The, the, it's spelled... Ish is spelled, um, um, gosh, Yod Alef Shin, or excuse me, Alef Yod Shin. I'm getting it backwards, sorry about that. Alef Yod Shin, right in the middle of, 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 of the name Ish, or, or the way God identifies Adam in the beginning, you have the Alef, the Yod, and the Shin, okay? And, uh, and, and later when we do the DVD, we're going to actually put this up on the screen so you can see it. You take the middle letter up, the Yod, and let's put it up here at the top and then you have the Aleph and the Sheen there, then you have Esh, which is fire. The Yod represents the divine name of God. But when you drop that down in there, now you have Ish, which is what? You have the fire of God. Think about this here. What did we just say was in the beginning? Yahi Od, the light, the spirit of God. Is what he was. Adam was a spirit, was a was was a portion of God's own life. Now remember, brother, it shouldn't be hard for us to understand this. That in the beginning the word was light, that it was God Himself. Many rabbinical teachers know this, but we also have to keep in mind that God is the the, the Shekinah, the pillar of fire. Everywhere we find in the Bible, Moses was led by the pillar of fire, the awe that was that God created. Basically, God is making a body for himself to dwell in, we might say. But in this case, it was light, a supernatural light. But he's trying to tell us things in Genesis that's really very difficult to understand, but we can go into that, maybe at a later time. But anyway, so when he makes Ish, then he takes, when he's creating, he created them together as one unit, Ish and Isha. Adam and Eve is, is there together. That's why he breathes in more than one life in him. He just didn't say, Nishmat Chai. You know, he didn't just say he breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, one life, but it was plural because Adam and Eve were both in the same body. Now, later we find out that God takes from uh, the side of Adam when he sees that he's not, you know, that he is, uh, that he is alone and he's going to make a help mate for him or, or someone that corresponds to him. See, uh, what I mentioned to you a, minute, a moment ago, let me just re refresh this verse to you here. In verse 27, I believe, in uh, Bereshit Aleph, Berek Aleph, uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 here, uh, in, uh, uh, what is that, uh, Kafvav, I believe? Yes, no, Kaf, no. Well, anyway, yeah. Um, no. Kafzain. <clears throat> uh, See, what does he say here? God created man in his image, and in the image of God created him. Male and female, he created them. See, they were together as one unit at that particular time. But, and I hope I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm going fast like this, but there's so much that I need to say to you in such a short period of time. Now, 
So we find that he breathes that breath of life into him, and then when we go further down, um, we find that uh, uh, Adam is going to be alone. He's, he, he, uh, and so God, and, and this is in uh, uh, Still, We're still in Berek Bet, uh, chapter 2. Uh, we're going to verse 21. So it says, So Hashem God cast a deep sleep upon the man because he sees that he's alone. He puts him into a deep sleep. Don't forget that. That deep sleep is so critical for you to realize this. He, puts, uh, he put upon the man and he slept and he took one of his sides and he filled in the flesh in its place. See, he took something from his side. He literally opened him up. Many of the rabbinical scholars, the sages, pardon me, believed that Adam was actually cut in half. And that's why I want you to pay attention to the split rock. That God had Moses smite that split rock was letting us know what God did with Adam and Eve. What God did with Adam. He split him down. And when he opened up Adam's side, from his side, he'd taken out his wife and he called it Isha. Mm. So beautiful. Aleph Shin He. That's how you spell Isha. Okay, but fascinating here, we have again, Aish in the name, and we have, hang, hang on just a second, brothers, before I get, before I get ahead of myself here. <laughs> so, uh, okay, let, let me just, okay, wait, wait, just a second, I'm wanting to get here, yeah, Aleph Shin He is how you spell Isha. I spelled the right, praise God. Okay, Lazot Yakore Isha. Now notice, and he takes, excuse me, um, he's, he's calling her a woman, but he goes like, okay, it says, Lazot Yakore, okay, for this shall be called Isha. Okay, he's going to call her Isha. He doesn't call Eve Eve in the beginning. She's not called Eve, she's called Isha. Eve means Chava. Is, is how you say even in, in Hebrew. It, it, it means the mother of life. Okay? And, and we're going to get into that. So he says, Lazot ikra isha ki for me'esh from the man or from ish. Lakat zot. He took her from ish. He took her from that fire of Yahweh that was inside of Adam, that spirit of God that's in him, he takes from there and he makes Isha. Now the rabbis notice that it's the word fire, Aish, and it's the two divine letters in God's name, yod Hey, that make up the two first letters of yod Hey vav Hey, uh, Yahweh there, that makes up this name here. And it's so fascinating to see that, that it represents God's own life is there. What is it I'm saying to you, my friend, brother, sister? If, if in Joel 2.38 it says that God in the last day would pour out His Spirit upon all flesh, He's going to pour out His Spirit. How's He going to pour out His Spirit? Because what was it that Adam and Eve had? They had the life of Almighty God. They had Ruach HaKadosh. They had the Spirit of God was dwelling in them. But when the fall comes, they lose that. They lose the Spirit of God that was giving them the eternal life to live forever and never die. And so Hashem had to make a way back. And when we get to the Garden of Eden, or not the Garden of Eden, but when we get to uh, when Moses comes and he delivers the children of Israel and they brought out and they go out to, to Mount Sinai and God was longing to dwell with us, even in us. And he has Moses go and smite the rock. Why does he smite the rock? He's showing us how he's going to bring back redemption. How he's going to bring back that spirit of Almighty God and put it in us. He has to do it. Now, we have to keep in mind what's going on all this time. What was happening from the days of, uh, even from Abraham, we were offering sacrifices. Our forefathers began to offer sacrifices for sin. Now, let's take a look at the sacrifice for sin. I want to bring to your attention, before I take you into redemption, and what we've overlooked in redemption, I want to bring you to 
I want to. I'd like to bring your mind to to the story of of uh, of Jacob when Jacob had the patriarchs, and of course we know that he loved um, uh, Jacob's heart was so tied up in um, not with Leah but but with his but with his uh, with Rachel Rachel. And, of course, he had two sons by Rachel. He had Yosef, Joseph, Rachel. He had, he had, with Rachel, he had Joseph and Benjamin, Benjamin. And the interesting thing about the whole thing is, is, of course, when Benjamin is born, when Benjamin is born, we find that Rachel dies in giving birth to him, as she wants to call him, Benoni. And, but, uh, but Jacob, or Israel, you know, as we know that Jacob wrestled with God, he overcame, and his name, God changed his name from uh, Yaakov to Israel. And, but he, he said, no, not so, he shall be called Benjamin. <clears throat> but these two sons, it's interesting, it's not that, it's not that, that, that uh, Yaakov did not love Leah, he did love her, but, and, and even his bondmaids, he loved them as well, but it, th there was a special bond when it come to, to, uh, to Rachel, and their reason is more significant. We see it in a natural, but it's the natural only is going to type that supernatural, the spiritual side of the realm of this. Now, when we see that the story comes along, Benjamin is a young man at the time, Joseph, or Joseph is a young man, Benjamin is still a boy, and Jacob sends out to his brothers to find to find uh, to see how they're doing on the on the grazing of the sheep and stuff, and of course they had got to where they hated him. Now I I know brothers, and as I said with you again, bear with me. I'm going to talk to you about things that the Christian people have not said to you before. Okay, this is I, I, I really want to bring that out to you. I know there's so much that the Christian people use. Oh, the story of Joseph is a perfect type of Jesus, and and and, they go, and, and on and on and on and on. But you know what? I, I adjure you to take the time to listen to what I'm telling you here. Because I'm going to talk to you about things that they don't talk about. I will, I'll, I'm going to mention now, don't get me wrong, I'm going to mention that. I mean, it's not to say, that, you know, Christian people are not bad people. I mean, we know there's many good Christian people. There's many good Christian people that stand by our people, that give their own lives. In the Holocaust, we have, we have the, uh, right there in the, at the Yad Vashem, we have the, 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 the area for the, for the righteous Gentiles. We know that God has blessed them. Uh, I can show you where the story of Ruth is such a beautiful type of, uh, of the Gentile people. Uh, gleaning from the four corners of the field, for example. Uh, Ruth is gleaning from, from, the, from the four corners of the, of the field, and which is a type of the return of Israel to our homeland. And that the Gentiles would play a great part in returning. That's why Moses gave that law, by the way, in case you didn't know. Moses gave the law not to glean from the four corners of the field. What for? He was leaving us a type and a shadow to look at. That in the latter days, when our people would be scattered to the four corners of the earth, that God would take a Ruth, a Moabitess, and would help bring our people back to our homeland. So yes, she has a part, she has a place that she plays in this. And Ruth, and, and here's what's fascinating. You know, Boaz wanted her for a wife. But the only way Boaz could get Ruth for a wife, he had to redeem Naomi. It's the same thing if, if Yeshua, if Jesus is Moshiach, he has to redeem Israel in order to take that bride. He's got to redeem us as well. And that would be the proof in itself that he's Moshiach. We are looking for a Redeemer. We are looking for Mashiach to come. We are looking for Mashiach to deliver us from the hand of our enemies. In fact, when Jesus came in His day, we were looking, our forefathers were looking for deliverance from the hand of the Romans. Why do you think the Roman Catholic Church is getting control of the land of Israel again? Why do you think Daniel's prophecy that they come up strong with a small people, it's the Palestinians, to get a hold of that land? Why do you think that in the Christian Bible it says the Gentiles shall tread the holy city underfoot for 40 and 2 months? Why do you think that's written there? 
And it's not the Palestinians, the Muslims, the Palestinians, the Gentiles there. They've tread the holy city down for hundreds of years. But in this case, the Romans haven't had it like that. But they're going to get it. And they're going to tread it down for 40 and two months, for three and a half years, before our own people wake up. Why? Because like it was in the story of Ezra, we have to mess up, we have to make a covenant with them like Ahab did with Jezebel and bring the idolatry in. But you know, everything happens for the good of our own people. God does this because why? He is going to bring judgment on that great whore. He's going to bring her down. And he's going to bring all of the denominational systems that back her and support her. Because remember, Jezebel had 450 prophets that were fed at her table. And, the, and the, all these different uh, denominational ministers that believe in replacement theology, all these denominational ministers that say that, well, Israel, you know, if you don't do it this way, our way, and everything, that you're lost and everything, God will bring them down. And like Elijah did. He will grab every one of them. He said, quick, grab them and don't let none of them escape because I'm going to kill all of them. And that will happen when God brings judgment against all the nations and gathers them down into Israel for judgment. Yes, there is a reason Rome has got that, they're getting that control. And when, when Ahab, when Shimon Perez makes that covenant with Israel here in the very near future, you will see the fulfillment. You will see then your two witnesses come on the scene of revelation. You will see the two, uh, the two anointed ones of Zechariah Come down of God and make known. He will bring those plagues. We will see Moshe ve'eliyahu come bold le Yisrael. So, anyway, gosh, I, I, I don't even know where I left off or, or, or what I got into here. But, but anyway, I'm, try, I'm trying to get, your, to get you to see something, though, my brother, sister. Our people, and I bet if I go back and saw the rest of this video, I'd see where I was at, where, what, what I got, or got off on. But God, God just helped me. He put Adam into a deep sleep. Now, oh, the story of Joseph. Thank you. Thank you, Father. When we look at the story of Joseph, though, he was sold out by his brothers. Well, we know, ironically, Jesus was sold out by his brothers. He, he was a Jew. We can't deny that. He was a Torah Jew. His brother James was a Torah Jew. Historical document proves that they were Torah abiding Jews. His family was. Now, we should not think it strange when people consider him to be Moshiach. We should not think it strange when Jews believe that. How many Moshiachs do we, have we had in our own historical background other than Jesus that we thought were Moshiach that never panned out to be Moshiach? But Rabbi Misraki points out the argument says that the peace did not come into the land. Nothing happened. We didn't get peace. We didn't get deliverance from our, from our people. Well, ironically, did not Jesus then read only half of Isaiah 61, a, a, a verse 2, which only brought the good tidings? But when we look at the story of Joseph, though, we also see Joseph is a type of Moshiach. Does not Isaiah 61 say that we would eat the riches of the Gentiles? Yes, he did. And we find that in the story of Joseph, we eat the riches of the Gentiles. Because Joseph is commanded to gather that grain. We, we know the story. Now, first, we find out that, that Joseph is sold out by his own brothers for 28, or uh, what is it, 28? Pieces of silver, I believe it was. 20 pieces of silver. I forget the exact number. But ironically, when they sell, when his brothers sell him out, put him in the ditch, supposing that he's dead, send him off down to Egypt, we see that they got to go back and face Yaakov. Yisrael. They have to face their father. And now they have a dilemma on their hands. What are they going to do? So the only thing they could think to come up with was the idea was to make it look like he did die. So they take a lamb from the flock and they cut its throat and they poured it over his coat. And they took that coat back to their father and said, he must have been torn into pieces by a wild beast. Now, God's word requires life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. We know that. 
Now, Moshe, Moses did not come and give him the law as of yet. But still, there was a law that we know that God had at that time. <clears throat> Those brothers should have everyone perished for what they did to, jo to what they did to Joseph. But I believe that when they took and killed that lamb and offered that sacrifice and placed it on his coat, on Joseph's coat, Hashem accepted that lamb, the blood of that lamb, as a sacrifice for their sins. Otherwise, those ten tribes would have been wiped out. But God didn't wipe them out. He didn't wipe out the ten tribes of Israel. Now, Benjamin, he was not guilty. He was not part of this conspiracy. And the, when Moses gave the commandment of the scapegoat, he said once a year they had to bring up two goats. One goat was to be offered for the sins of Israel. The other one, they were to take and place the, the priest, place their hand upon the goat's head and he would confess the sins of Israel and he was to be taken by a strong man out into the wilderness and to be turned loose to bear the sins of Israel far away. Joseph played that type out in the law of Almighty God to the T. He took the sins of his brothers and he bore them to a far land away from where they were at. They were, they, he went down into Egypt with the sins of his brother hidden from the eyes of his father. And they took the other goat and they cut his throat and they put the blood on his mantle, took it back to his father and said, Lo, he's been killed by a wild beast. He's dead. There's your sacrificial goat. There's your scapegoat. Joseph was the scapegoat. He bore the sins of his brothers, the iniquities of his brothers far away. Oh, the story is more beautiful though. You can, if you want to take and read Isaiah 61 now and go along with Isaiah 61 and what we're talking about, you can begin to compare the two and see the parallel, why they get double and everything. Double blessing at that, no less. Now, we find in the story of, of Jesus, Yeshua, the same thing. Our people sold him out. Now, Rabbi Misrachi, Rabbi Winston, many other rabbis, Rabbi Mikowitz, Rabbi Baris, rabbis from Israel that are watching this video, I, I, I ask you, my brother, if we have Joseph's life as a type of the sacrificial scapegoat and the goat that is offered as a sacrifice, and we can see it laying in there, if he is a type then of that, then we have to look at the type of Moshiach. We have to. How else can we, how else can we look at this? And then we look, at, we look at Jesus with his own life and everything. What happens? He comes. He, then, he, then if Jesus comes and he has to be, he has to be both scapegoat and sacrificial lamb for the sins of Israel. And when Daniel looks at our sins and says our sins and iniquities are going to be forgiven, and even God, he asks God, what does all these things mean later in Daniel? And God tells him, the angel tells him, seal it up. Seal up the book and it'll be revealed in the end time. You're hearing the revelation of what you're looking for. Yeshua had to play out both scapegoat and Moshiach has to be the scapegoat and the sacrificial goat. And he was. Because we offered him up. And of course the Gentiles got a hold of him too. He was crucified and his blood was sprinkled onto the altar. Now, some might argue and say, if he's truly the Lamb of God, then his blood had to be poured out on the mercy seat. Now, there are some that say, well, it was done in heaven. I know, I know how it is, brother. We're looking for something here on this earth. Well, let me tell you something. You can look up a man by the name of Ronald Wyatt. He's from Tennessee. Actually, I think he's from Kentucky, actually, originally. But Ron Wyatt, he, he, he's no longer uh, living today. He passed away. He was a Christian man that was like a, they'd call him a modern-day Indiana Jones, I guess you'd call it. But, but, but Ron, one of the things that he found underneath Golgotha, right there outside the, the Damascus Gate, where 
right there behind the Muslim bus station there, where you see the skull there, where it is believed that Yeshua, not inside the city, come on, let's wake up. Not where the Vatican wants to put his death, burial, and resurrection at, but outside the city, there is a place on Golgotha there where this man, Ronald Wyatt, when he had gotten permission from the Israeli government to go inside and to do research underneath that area there, found a stone box, a broken lid on top of that box. When he finally was able to get into where he could see inside the box, he saw the Ark of the Covenant laying in there. The mercy seat. And ironically, at the top of the cave was a split in the earth. And a brown substance was there. And that brown substance, where the stone box that he found the ark in, brown substance was on the stone box. He took a sample of that, took it to an Israeli lab. And the Israeli lab took that brown substance and they said that it came back to life. And it was blood. Ron later found, doing through some kind of testing, I, I don't know all these things, you can look it up for yourself, but through testing, when the earth quaked, this split and it went right down to the top of that cave. And right there above that area was a post hole where he believed that the cross that Jesus was on was placed. So we do have proof that the blood went on the mercy seat. There is a witness, and not just one, his son was with him. And we require the witness of two. No wonder why God brings two witnesses at the end time. And by the way, that tribulation, that's for the Gentiles. We've already been through ours. We went through it during 70 AD with Titus, the Roman general. There's another Roman coming into town, into Jerusalem soon. And judgment will come at the hand of Moses and Elijah. Anyway, let's get to the point of all this. In this case here, then, if the blood sprinkled on the mercy seat that was there, then we have the fulfillment of what God requires. And in this case here, as a Lamb of God, He gave His life. And He gave His life, so the blood came down and sprinkled onto the seat. Now, we're, I'm not done yet. I want you to really take time to listen. I mean, please bear with me. If anything else, bear with me in what I'm telling you, brothers and sisters. But... According to the Christian Bible, this man Yeshua, Jesus, rose again and was caught up into heaven. He carried the sins of our forefathers far away. But he also was the actual sacrificial goat and gave his life as well. He did say when he was here, I lay my life down and I'll raise it back up again. I have power to do so. Hmm. Sounds like then he may just be Yahior. I want though for you to think about something. When we think about redemption. We have the Torah that lays out the redemption process that God requires. When God put Chaim in Adam and Eve, they lost that particular life, that source of life, the life of Yahweh. They lost it. God even says in our Torah that he put those angels around the tree of life to guard it in case they go back and put their hands on the tree of life in a fallen state and live forever. Why? Because God requires a way, a sacrifice had to be offered. Now, for Adam and Eve, he offered the first lamb that was ever slain in the natural. He offered it and placed it, the skins of that lamb on their body as a covering for their sins. But, we still, we still wonder then, why then does Moses smite this rock? Why is it called Hatsua? Why does the rock split in half? Why does the water come out of this rock? What is this rock, Steve? What is this rock, Ketani Erbi Nun? Tell me, what does this rock have to do with Yeshua? What does it have to do with Adam and Eve? When Jesus was on earth, he was speaking to a Samaritan woman, and he says to her, Woman, bring me a drink. She said, Sir, the well is deep. You have nothing to draw with. 
You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. I'm just paraphrasing this. But why do you ask me to bring you a drink? And Jesus says to her, if you knew who it was that was speaking to you, you would ask me for a drink and I would give you water that you don't have to come here to draw anymore. He was giving her a sign that we should, our forefathers should have recognized who he was. But we couldn't recognize. He made a promise to Abraham. He said, you shall be a father of many nations. That's, this is God's doing. When Joseph was sold out into Egypt and his brothers come back and they're, and they're groaning within their heart, you know, because they're beginning to recognize their sins and what they did. They did, you know, they tried to hide it though for a long time while he bore in his body their sins. They tried to hide those sins. You know, they hid it from their father. Everything they could do. But God was looking at the blood of that sacrifice. And he was looking at the one who bore in his body the scars of rejection. And that was Joseph, Yosef. So, but anyway, Jesus makes that comment. If you knew it was a, you'd ask me for a drink, giving us a sign to look for. So if Abraham's gonna be a father of many nations, see, there's gotta be a reason why we don't see it, why our fathers didn't see it right then. Not only that though, God said we're a promised people, a chosen people, a priestly nation to offer up sacrifice for sin. And you Christians that are willing to condemn Israel and you constantly write me and you say that God cannot save Israel outside of Jesus. They, they got to accept Jesus as their Savior or they can't be saved. And how are you saved? The Jews are going to be saved all down to this time they never accepted Jesus? Why do you think Joseph's brothers lived it all? Because God took the blood that they shed and applied it as a sacrifice for their sins. When the Jews were up there and they were crying out for the crucifixion of Jesus, they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. They meant it in a derogatory way, but God meant it as a pardoning grace for them. That's why Jesus had to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Because God had blinded them in order for them to carry out the duty that they were meant to do. To be the priestly nation that, that our forefathers were called to do. And that was to offer, uh, offer the sacrifice for sins. So we come back. I come back. I, I'm taking you so many different ways. And I know God have mercy and help me to get you to understand this. So what do we have here? He gives her that sign. I'll give you water. And then when he's given up to be sacrificed on Calvary, they hang him on this cross. And he dies. Not from a natural death. He laid down his own life. When he laid down his own life, that Roman soldier come up there and he took that sword, that spear he had, and he jabbed it into his side and he ripped open his side. Ripped it open. This is why Moses smote the rock, brought the elders of Israel out. Israel was not the one to smite him though. The Romans were going to smite him. Our job was to go out and bring the elders of Israel together and to judge him for the salvation of the world. Our judge, job as a priestly nation was to offer up Moshiach for the sacrifices of the world because there had to be a scapegoat and there had to be a lamb offered up for the sacrifice of the sins of Israel, and the sins of the world. And because of the way it happened, that's why Joseph says to his brother, don't be angry with yourselves. God did this to save life. Not just the life, not just the life of Israel, but the life of Asenath, his wife, and his sons that were coming afterwards. And because of the sacrifice that Joseph was willing to do, willingly, he saved a world from famine. When Jesus' side was ripped open, though, from his side came water and blood. 
When Moses smote that rock, that water came forth. It was the water of life. And you read in Genesis, the waters. From the waters. Inside of Yeshua. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they separated themselves from God and lost the Spirit of Almighty God. When God came and breathed in their nostrils, Eitz Chaim, He showed that He was that tree of life. When Yeshua was still on the earth, He even said to His apostles, His disciples, He breathed on them, Receive you the Holy Ghost. And when He breathed upon them, He was showing that He was Eitz Chaim. He was only showing a natural so that when the supernatural came and what happened when his side was ripped open, the water that came from his side was showing that inside of him was the life of Yahweh. It was the life of Almighty God in a plural form coming out and being able to be imparted back on us. Why? Because Adam and Eve, this is why Eve has changed from Isha to Chava. Chava. Because she is the mother of life. She is the one that will continue to bring forth children and her children's children and children's children. Because God said multiply and replenish the earth. It never changed that. It never changed the process that God gave. But what was missing was we were cut off from Eitz Chaim. We were cut off from the Holy Spirit, the life of God to come upon the children. So God took and created another Adam. Even the Christians call it the second Adam. And in this Adam here was already Eitz Chaim. He took, when he created the second Adam, he took Eitz Chaim and put it in a body of flesh. He took God himself, became material. He became a human being. Walked as a man. But the only way God could release that life was by death. Why? What did he do with Adam? In order to bring forth a bride, what did he do with Adam? He put him to a deep sleep like death and opened up his side. And from his side, from, from the Ish, from that man, the spirit of Yahweh that's inside of him, he took Yisha and pulled her out. She was already there the entire time, but he had no way to fellowship with his wife. And God longs for fellowship with us, but He has no way to fellowship with us because we're human bodies with nefesh, with a soul. We're walking on this earth, but no life of Yahweh to quicken it. How are we going to get that life to quicken us if God didn't make a way for it? And this is what He did. This is what He did at Calvary. This is why He came. He had to fulfill the law of Moshe. He had to be scapegoat and the, the goat as well, the sacrificial lamb. And so when his side was torn open, that water that came forth was just showing that the life of God came out. That's why on the day of Pentecost, they all began to stagger and speak with other tongues and stuff as the Spirit gave them utterance, as the Scripture says in, in Acts chapter 2. Fulfilling Joel 2.38 of that day. But the thing is, is Joel 2.38 is for this day. Does not Zechariah say, we will look upon him whom we've pierced? Did he not say that we would separate each one according to the family? It doesn't say tribes. It says families. The house of David apart, the house of Nathan apart, and their sons and, and wives apart. According to Orthodox tradition, my brother, sister, where are we at? What is the hour that we're living in? And I know we are not the ones that are guilty of the blood of Jesus Christ. The Jews of today, we did not offer him up. We could say that we didn't do it. But how are we going to get to HaKadosh? HaKadosh! Benevi! How are we going to get HaKadosh, Ruach HaKadosh, Benevi in our hearts? The Spirit of God in our hearts. God cannot change. Does not Hashem's name, yod Hey vav Hey, we break it down into the three verbs. Is He not the same yesterday, today, and forever? He can't change. 
The way he brought eternal life the first time, he's got to do it the same. If he took Adam, and in order to bring forth that life, he opened him up, and he brought forth his wife from him to, to fill with the Holy Spirit, then he's got to do it the same way. So he had to make another Adam. He had to open up his side. He had to take another bride from him, which we are his bride. We are the bride of Yahweh, the bride of Hashem, the bride of Moshiach. Not as nonsense as Perry Stone has to say. I know you brothers, you Jewish brothers, you don't know who the man probably is. Probably a famous Christian man, minister says there's uh, God has a, is the bride of uh, Israel and, and Jesus is the bride of the Jews. I mean Gentiles. Nonsense. We don't believe in two or three gods. One God. Breaks the very laws of Almighty God when he says for a, it's a sin for a son to take his father's life. To be put to death, no less. Who, who, who is Moshiach then? It's Yehayeh. Excuse me. Yehayeh. <laughs> of course. Beta. Chatel Yodea. Oh my gosh. Yahweh among us. Yahweh. He is here with us in our midst, able to give us the Ruach HaKadosh. Akshav. Now, not later, no, you're there. Oh, brother. So he put Adam into that deep sleep and he took from him his wife. He has to do the same for us. Christ went into a deep sleep, death, and his side was torn open, even in the temple. Is not Ravi Orli. He even says, the temple is laid out like the human body, and where the Holy of Holies stands is where the human heart is. Where the altar of God, where the sacrifices were offered, not far from there. And there's a little trough that goes out the side of the temple. And when those sacrifices and all that blood was being poured, it went to a little trough under the ground, poured in the water and everything to wash the blood outside the temple. No wonder why it was blood and water that come out the side of Jesus, because blood and water comes out the side of the temple. Now, real quick, let me just share this with you, and I'm going to end here. It's been a very long message. Joseph, when he's getting ready to reveal himself to his brethren, remember I said to you, we, we, we weren't guilty there. We know that. Neither was Benjamin, was he? When his brothers come down and Joseph began to speak to them through an interpreter, he knew Hebrew. He knew it very well. But he made like he didn't know it. In other words, we're in our homeland by his grace. He sustains us with the very food, a gift. It's a gift to us to be in our homeland right now. Not because of anything good we did. The, here, the very ten brothers that did nothing but evil and the Joseph are being treated kindly with gifts. They go down, they get their food. They're, of course, they're accused of spies. You know why they're accused of spies? Because the church has accused our people of the death of Jesus Christ for 2,000 years. That's why they went through the hard times. That's why he locked them up into the inner court, into the, into the prison there. And he locked them up for what? Two days. Let him out on the third day. We're in the third day, brother. We're fixing to be freed to see what's going on. But here's what's interesting. He locked them up for that amount of time. But they're coming back. First time when they come back. And as he sends them back, he sends them back with all their, with the corn, with the money they brought in their bag. And of course, he returns back that money with them and they go back. They open up their bag. And what's interesting, they open up their bag at the hotel, Ben Malone, at the hotel in the desert on the way back home. And in that, at that hotel, they find their money and they begin to recognize their sin. Why was it at the hotel? A stable. Not, excuse me, not a stable, but at a hotel. Because when Jesus come on the earth and he was in the womb of his mother, the first place our 
fathers rejected him was when Joseph was trying to find a decent place for his wife, Mary, to have a child. And we rejected him. And we didn't allow a proper place for her to have a child, so he was sent to a stable. That's why we found the corn at the hotel. But anyway, they go back, and the father, uh, Jacob, when he finally does send them back, he gives them double the money, and he tells them, he said, peradventure, it was an oversight of the master. Take back double money. Why double money? There's a reason for that too. Because God forgives us for the sins that were done to Joseph and the sins that were done to Jesus. They've already been paid for. Sends back both. They go back. They take Benjamin with them who was not guilty of the blood. And then Joseph has a great big feast set up for him. He doesn't reveal himself yet. He sees Benjamin, and when he sees Benjamin, he can't hardly contain. My brother, when we have come home, the Jews of today, in our homeland, that were not guilty of the blood of Jesus, he can hardly contain himself, wanting to reveal himself to us. But our eyes are still withholding we haven't been able to see it yet. Many of us. Many, some of us are starting to see it now. But our eyes are still withholding for many of us. And so, Joseph takes and he, his cup and he commands his servant, put it in the youngest one's bag. Benjamin. And they leave. They rush him out early that morning. And then he sends the servant out to overtake him. He says, why have you repaid evil for good? And they said, my Lord, what are you talking about? He said, you've stolen my master's cup. The one that he drinks with. They said, whoever, whoever has a cup, let him die. Or we'll become his servants. And this, they went through, he started from the eldest and went all the way down to the youngest. And when they saw the cup was in Benjamin's bag, then the weeping and the repenting began. Because they know they had sinned and their iniquities were being found out. And Benjamin was not guilty. Neither are we guilty today, my brethren. And why the cup? Because the cup shows that we rejected Yeshua. Our forefathers rejected Him at the communion table when Judas Iscariot sold Him out. But the cup is in our hand. And, and we weren't guilty of His blood. But now, we have the cup. Why does God do that beautiful parable? It's to show that in the last days that Israel will be holding the cup of Yeshua in your hands and asking you, what are you going to do with the blood of Jesus Christ now that you have it? That blood that he applied. Our forefathers, when they said, let his blood be upon us and our children. And what they meant to be evil, God used as a covering for their sins so that our forefathers would not be lost. So the fathers down through the years that never did recognize Jesus as Messiah, they're not lost. As long as they tried their best to keep Torah, long as they were not evil, they did the commandments, love thy neighbor as thyself. They couldn't be lost. Do you know in the Christian Bible, in a book called Revelation, it is written, there were souls under the altar crying out, how long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood upon those that killed us. That is the Jewish people that were martyred. Christians don't cry out for vengeance, so it couldn't be Christians. It had to be Jews. The cup is in our hand. Now we have that blood in our hands. We can either drink it, and it was actually wine in his cup, not literal blood. It was all symbolic. He never meant for us to be cannibalist. He was just trying to show us that man did not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. My brothers, what will we do with this Jesus called Christ, Yeshua, 
קורא המשיח. אני שואל את אורך, אורכם, I ask you this question. בהיום. בהיום. On this day. God bless you. The decision now is ours. What will we do? Let us talk.